In that period when I was running FBA accounting, we also closed a small other acquisition. So a lot going on. I ended up going to the doctor and being like, my chest hurts. Am I okay? And he's like, am I having a heart attack? And he's like, you're just really stressed, but you'll be okay. He's like, sir, I, I've seen this before. You, you have a case of trying to do a major acquisition before an IPO. Is this thing on? Yesterday's price is not today's price. Why, thank you, Fat Joe. Welcome to Run the Numbers, where I interview world-class CFOs, operators, and the VCs who fund them on how to get the most out of your company's performance. This podcast is a playbook of sorts for ambitious people in the world of finance, strategy, and operations. Today, my guest is Philip Watson, CFO of Paddle. Paddle is the leading payments infrastructure for subscription businesses operating internationally. Philip originally came from Discover.org, leading the FP&A group during the acquisition and rebranding as ZoomInfo and then through their successful IPO. We spend the episode going through the nuances of an initial public offering, the before, during, and after, and how mergers and acquisitions played a role in building the company's attractive financial profile. During this episode, we cover acquisitions for tech versus acquisitions for revenue, what it's like to operate within debt covenants and how to track them as an FP&A professional, FP&A's role in the IPO process, building a beat and raise forecast, picking which metrics you'll disclose and guide to, frameworks he relies upon as a CFO for decision-making and communication, and much more. Philip does an amazing job taking us back into the moment of the day of the IPO, one of the first of the COVID era, and how it felt to ring the bell from behind a computer. And for anyone in FP&A who will be involved in mergers and acquisitions, this is a masterclass on how acquisitions are done at scale and on short, stressful timelines. All this and much, much more after a short word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash metrics. That's netsuite.com slash metrics to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash metrics. Well, you know what I always say, maintaining compliance is never complete, which is why most security and IT teams feel like they're always in audit purgatory. <laughs> I'm there right now. But there is a solution and it's easier than you think. Escape the infinite loop by using ThoroughPass's compliance and audit solution. ThoroughPass is the only solution using AI-infused technology and in-house auditors to take your team from start to stamp without leaving the platform. As a winner of multiple G2 awards, including top awards for usability and service, your team is in good hands with ThoroughPass. From onboarding with dedicated experts to audits from in-house auditors who know every aspect of your framework needs. You can have complete confidence in your ThoroughPass compliance journey. ThoroughPass is the only solution to offer audits for your most needed security frameworks. I'm talking HIPAA to High Trust and SOC 2 to ISO 27001. Woo! If you need PCI, DSS, pen tests, or any other major compliance framework, ThoroughPass can hook you up. With ThoroughPass, you never need to worry again. Relax, we fix audits. Find more at ThoroughPass.com. That's T H O R O P A S S.com. Tell me, boy, CJ sent you. They'll hook you up. Boom. What's going on? Welcome to Run the Numbers, the number two business podcast in Estonia as of this morning. <laughs> hey, CJ. How's it going, man? I appreciate you joining me. I've been a big fan of Paddle for a while, and this is going to be this is gonna be a fun jam session. I'm really excited. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. 
You're a first time CFO. I, I got to ask, what's been the biggest responsibility that surprised you off the bat? Like, it, have you had to pick up anything that you're like, whoa, this is in the realm of CFO and I have to do this now? As you said, I, I'm four months into my first CFO job. So so it's all new. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I joke with, with people all the time, like it, just because there's a number doesn't mean finance has to do it, right? But I, I have found that people very much default to anything with numbers finance, finance does, but I'm sure that's a common occurrence of the places. You know, things that I quite frankly knew I didn't know all that much about, but I've had to get the seed real fast on are things like taxes, particularly at Paddle, which like that's our reason for being is to help companies around the world, like handle their VAT and indirect taxes. You know, my, my experience with indirect tax before this was, was pretty minimal. Uh, so having to learn about that, having to learn things around cap table management, didn't have as much experience with that. Certainly just learning that there's so much that has to be done to kind of help a business grow, to have a business scale and to get it to the maturity level that people expect it to be. You know, a lot of that falls in the CFO. It's kind of a tremendous amount of that admin function is, you know, CFO and, and general counsel and things like that. So just learning a lot of kind of the undercovers behind the scenes things. The cap table stuff is so funny and rings so true to me because I had done a lot of the cap table modeling and understanding like this percentage is fully diluted and we're budgeting for this many shares. But I was so nervous the first time just to press the button on like the consent to go out to everybody. And it sounds so stupid to say it out loud, but like I was I, I was rereading everything about 10 times, but to hit that button on Carta and send it out, I was I was very nervous. That's totally true. And, you know, I think about things like we have come, we have employees around the world, right? I, I don't know if, if you guys do, but it's like, hey, the tax treatment is different for these type of options in whatever Columbia, making it up that it is in the States or in England or something like that. So so many issues that I haven't had to think through before, but, but I'm now being faced with, which, you know, it's all part of the experience. This is what I signed up for. And I'm super happy to be here and super glad I get a chance to do it. And one of the things that I didn't expect was how many contracts I'd have to read specifically for procurement, because I really am like the backstop for what, what we say yes to in sign. And I think in the past, like a lot of contracts would kind of get, you know, I, I would see them, I would be aware of what we were buying, but I didn't have to read like every term. But now it's like, dude, you got to like dot your I's and cross your T's on these. Yeah, no, it's on, it's on you or it's on me for sure. Uh, I actually kind of like that. I don't mind the contracts. I think maybe in a former life, maybe I like went to law school or something. <laughs> I, I guess in that sense, at least like then I feel like I have control over what we're going to spend. And to me, that's really important. So yeah, definitely a lot of paper coming through, but that part I actually don't mind. I've used this tool Tropic to just put all my contracts through it and figure out when the renewal dates are coming up and whatnot. But I am I am realizing how many different things that we buy as an org that I have to be aware of. And I've tried to make myself, I don't want to say a choke point because I want to enable people, but at the same time, you don't want like your head of an engineering who, who knows Kotlin, but doesn't know how to negotiate a contract for like GitHub doing it all like in a silo. So that's been something that, you know, as a first time CFO, I've tried to balance enabling people, but also like, I should probably be the one to sign this and read it before it goes out. Yeah. I mean, to that point, I actually had a, a meeting with a member of our legal team yesterday and we're building our very first, maybe not very first, but the first we updated a lot of time approval matrix, right? Of like, who can, who at the firm is actually able to sign for what and for what amount. And I think that's actually like a really important thing that people don't get to for a while or they don't keep it refreshed as the org uh, evolves, right? Because, you know, as, as you get bigger, you have more layers of management and you maybe want to give certain people signing authority for certain things, but other people not and such. So yeah, that's a real tactical problem I was dealing with yesterday. But these are all good things. They're all like, you know, growth issues, which it's better to have those than, than the alternative. Yeah, if you're going through a discount matrix, that means you're spending money, which means you're making money. So that's all good. Before Paddle, you were at Discover Org, and other people may know it as Zoom Info. And I went down a rabbit hole of looking at the cool acquisitions that you were a part of during that time. And you were running FPNA, and FPNA is intimately involved in a lot of these transactions because a lot of people think, you know, biz dev will find it and it's like kind of hunting a bear in the forest and then they just push them in the cabin and they say, okay, now integrate it. But FPNA has to do a lot more to make sure that it's actually successful. And so the two that I caught my eye at Discover Org is you did Rain King and then you did Zoom Info. I was hoping maybe you could take us through each of those and maybe we could pick out some lessons just through the FPNA lens. Yeah, totally. Happy to talk about those. We actually, so as you said, I ran FPNA at Discover World, which became Zoom Info. We took their name for seven and a half years, I actually founded the team there. So I was involved in every acquisition they did from October of 2015 until when I left 
in February of last year. I think it was 13 acquisitions, if I remember correctly. And you're right, the Rankin and the ZoomInfo were the two largest deals. So they're both really interesting case studies because they were both what I call transformative deals for Discover. I mean, they like it, it really brought us up to a whole nother level after we completed those. But we did them for two different reasons that had to t- run two different integration plays. The ranking one is 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 interesting. It was our first, the first big one we did as a management team. And so we had not proven ourselves before. We had to go prove it to TA, who was our our backer at the time, our financial sponsor, that, um, that it was, you know, they would allow us to take out that debt to go do it. We had to build the full kind of model and show all the pro forma synergies because the reason behind the ranking transaction was that. Ranking and Discover essentially had the same business. They were about the same size, about the same growth rates. Discover was profitable and Ranking was not. And that was the big difference. That's what allowed us to go buy them. So we were able to go in and we built a, a model and a plan that said, we can go in, we can achieve a tremendous amount of cost synergies by buying Ranking because we're essentially, we, we, it's essentially the same functions as we already had. So we took the best of theirs and the best of ours and mixed some of their salespeople some of their product people replaced ours with them, replaced their GNA people with ours and, and their execs with ours, basically, and did a combined company. But we literally went in on day one and took out, I think, two thirds of the cost. I mean, I remember handing out packets there on site the first day, which is you know, not a fun experience, but, but a thing that you could do. But what that allowed us to do was it allowed us to generate enough EBITDA where we could lever up against that to go fund the acquisition with debt and then pay that down over the next few years, which we did. So. It was a really interesting business case for us of can we actually go execute against the synergies that we have put on paper in this financial model? And we had to go prove it every day because if we didn't, you know, we would not have enough money to pay to pay down then. So like that was one of real just operational rigor, I would say. The Zoom Info one was was different in the sense that Discover had, you know, they saw data. And Discoverworks data at the time was very good. It was very deep, but it was narrow. So they focused on IT technology data and it was super accurate. And it went down very detailed data, but it didn't really extend out of the IT vertical that much. ZoomInfo was very broad data, but very narrow. So they, they had data on everybody, but some of it wasn't great. A lot of it wasn't accurate. It didn't go very deep and very detailed. So we said, hey, what if we combine those two things together to get a deep, broad accurate data set, we could then go sell that and get a lot of revenue synergies. So when we went to go buy Zoom Info, the play there was not, let's take out a bunch of costs. We actually didn't take out that much cost. There's a few overlapping GNA roles, but it was like, hey, let's go build the model and then go execute against the revenue synergies we can get by cross-selling all of these products into each other's customer bases and then growing the whole pie even more. And so I think those two deals are like, they're they're very representative of going to execute against two different M&A plans, but, but show two different paths to successful M&A, if that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. And just to play it back, the first acquisition was all about the cost synergies. The second one was all about the revenue synergies. But I'd argue there was a, there was a third component or dynamic to this where you were becoming the only show in town at the end of the day because they were doing similar things that you were doing. Was, was that kind of in the back of your head or a driver to the business case? Those were thoughts in our head for sure. We actually went and got HSR review on the first ranking deal, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's one of the antitrust reviews. So I actually had to be on the phone call with the FTC and such. And so, yeah, we had to, you know, you know, and they, they agreed with us that the merger wasn't like competitive or anything like that. But yeah, those were certainly thoughts in a market that was expanding. Can't, how do we go get some share faster? Let's go build a thing, like particularly with the Zoom Info acquisition, let's go build a new box. That is the best of both of these other smaller boxes and make it bigger. So totally. And how did you as a management team thinking about the kind of string of pearls acquisition theory of, you know, let's do small ones, tuck in, some will be great, some won't work, but, you know, people won't make a huge deal of it because we didn't spend much versus, you know, bet the company kind of M&A deals. I think the important part is we knew what we were good at. So like Zoom Info Discover World, we were really good at go to market. My I have a hypothesis that some software companies are product companies, some are self, some software companies are sales companies. Discover World Info very much a, a sales like culture, sales like company. So we were really good pushing product through our kind of distribution channels, our AEs and our AEMs. So those acquisitions, the smaller ones that we went to go do, the tuck-ins, they were mainly people that had a good product 
that would fit into our product suite that we didn't have or would be too expensive for us to go build, but that we knew we could monetize immediately by pumping it through all of our sales reps. So all of those small ones, it's it all you can basically say they all had less good go to markets than Discovery did, but they had really great product. And so we just plugged in the product, plugged it into our go to market, and then went from there. And those all those generally worked really, really well. Yeah. So you were really good at the distribution component. And you said, if we can strap another kick-ass product to this or make our product even better, then that that's a synergy we want to explore. Exactly. Yeah. That was the play. If you go back to the first acquisition, just to dig into the cost component, how much of the business case was done beforehand of like, this is what the P&L will look like after? Was that pretty much baked or was there kind of an exploration afterwards of like, hey, now we actually have to make this work now that we're together? Yeah, no, we had to have a really solid business case because we were also looking at, at a potential exit afterwards. So we bought Ranging, I think, in 2017, if I remember it correctly. And then in 2018, TA, who was our, our sole private equity sponsor at the time, or our primary pri- private equity sponsor at the time, actually sold a piece in a secondary transaction to Carlisle. So at Carlisle come into TA, but the numbers Carlisle was re- were relying on were the, the synergy numbers after we did the transaction. So Knowing that that was a thing maybe to come when we were doing this this modeling in 2017, we had to build a reasonable and defensible model that we could get underwritten on the debt side to go get the debt on the deal and would pass muster with a potential another private equity sponsor coming in to the cap table. So we, we had to build that model, a lot of thoroughness, a lot of going back and forth with TA on it. And then we actually had to go prove that we were executing against it every month. So I built, I remember the thing, we called it the, the master synergy tracker, where we're looking at, you know, show the pro forma savings, show how those are going down, but that they're actually showing up in the P&L as, you know, heads are rolling off and you're getting, you know, canceling contracts and things like that. So you can already see the movement of the dollars on the P&L from the pro forma section up into the adjusted EBITDA section and then up into the regular EBITDA section to kind of over time. So it was, it was really for somebody that, had not, that was like my first time to go with that level of depth and intensity into a merger model. And like, it was really cool to see afterward in the middle of it, it was awful. But, um, you know, afterward is like, yeah, we executed everything we said and actually came out ahead on the synergies there. So very important to like, know what you're getting into when you go do M&A and very important to build a solid business case before and track against it afterwards. So, you know, if you're on track, if you're off track and how to pivot to get back on track, if you fall off track. Because it's never going to work exactly as you played it out, right? I think mean, nothing ever does. So just being able to say like, hey, you know, we need to we need to make a change here, but we can still get to the numbers via this path as opposed to the, the path we laid out before. Philip, I'm imagining a master synergy tracker V207 in some folder somewhere. Yeah, something like that. I mean, I think the analysts that worked for me, they 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 uh, they worked really hard and got ground down on it, but it worked and it got done what you do. And I think you know, Carla came in at a, a pretty nice valuation for us at the time, and they were happy and we were happy, and so it was a good transaction. I've never been a finance leader with a lot of debt on the balance sheet. Does your mindset change the instant that you kind of have that new setup? It's interesting because you know that that debt is there, and in some ways, it's easy to forget about because you're like, ah, oh, it's just it's just this thing. It's sitting over there. It's this light on my balance sheet. But you know, it 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 is cash out the door every month. And then on top of that, CJ, it's also the compliance with the debt, right? So for those of your listeners that have never had debt, not only you know you they give you the money, then yes, you have to pay it back, but you still have to fill in a lot of forms every month or every quarter, depending on your documents. And those documents also restrict you from being able to do other things in some instances. So you'll have to go get permission to do other M&A perhaps, or to pay out these bonuses, or to, you know, there's a lot that can depend on what your debt covenants say, but it's more than just you have to pay cash out the door every month. There are a lot of other rules you have to follow too. And I don't, I don't know that first time people going into that situation are all that cognizant of that second part. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. As a SaaS CFO, I know firsthand how difficult it is to report on SaaS metrics. We've all seen a deal close at the end of the month, but the customer's contract doesn't actually start until the middle of the next month, creating the classic discrepancy between bookings or committed ARR and actual ARR, the real stuff. That's why I'm so pumped to be partnering with Maxio, a company trusted by thousands of SaaS companies to understand these reporting nuances. They basically built and automated the SaaS dashboard I tried to manually cobble together for three years. In 2022, SaaS Optics and Chargeify combined to become Maxio, 
the only billing and financial operations platform that was purpose-built for B2B SaaS. They're helping SaaS finance teams automate billing and RevRec, manage collections and payments, and put together investor-grade reporting packages. Visit maxio.com slash run the numbers to learn how Maxio can help you supercharge financial operations in 2024. Request a demo using the Run the Numbers link and receive a 10% discount on your first year with Maxio. That's maxio.com forward slash run the numbers. So for that one, if I have the timeline right, that was pretty close to the IPO, right? It was. So I remember we met in Labor Day weekend, the week before Labor Day weekend, we had an executive Offsite at my CEO's house in, in in Las Vegas, and interestingly enough, this was when we were transitioning CFOs. So the CFO was on the room. I was representing finance. We went down. We had an executive offsite. We did some other work. One of our board members was there, and we said, "Hey, like, what are some things we can do?" And we laid out our kind of growth plan. And one of you know, we had various various blocks in our bridge for growth. And one of them was acquire more data to go sell. And that's literally, and this was, you know, let's call it August of 2018. This was literally the genesis of, well, maybe what if happens if we would go buy Zoom? And so we started there at Labor Day weekend with that idea, the germ of an idea, we ran forward for a few months, went without a CFO during this time. So I was running FPA and accounting at the time, hired the guy who became my boss, uh, Cameron Heiser. He got, came in at the end of 2018. We closed the Zoom Info purchase. February 1 of 2019. I mean, this was a, a big deal for us. They were getting about somebody roughly equal to our size and they had international operations, primarily in Israel, and we didn't. So this is a whole new ball game of learning kind of a, a multi-nation merger. I remember, you know, we worked that merger hard. We, we, we got a revenue plan. We were getting it. The August 2019 board meeting, our board said, hey, we want you to be ready to go public March of 2020. We said, oh man. So we went, oh, you ran hard to get from August of 2019, integrating these two companies, rebuilding the product, rebuilding the whole, a whole new Salesforce instance, rebuilding everything to go, to go integrate these companies, to get ready to go public March of 2020. We were about a week out of the roadshow, around before the roadshow, if I remember correctly, which is when the world shut down. We then bided our time, March of April, re racked the numbers, saw that the business was going to be okay, saw that we were actually growing now, and they decided, hey, we can go public now. And so we were actually the first company at the gates to go public in June of 2020. So that was the timeline of idea to buy Zoom Info until go public, a pretty compressed, basically a little bit longer than a year long time period. Yeah, pretty nuts. How many years did that one year take off your life, Philip? Funny, funny story now at the time, but no, but not at the time. I in that period when I was running FPA accounting, we also did a call, close a small other acquisition. So a lot going on. I ended up going to the doctor and being like, my chest hurts. Am I okay? And he's like, am I having a heart attack? And he's like, you're just really stressed, but you'll be okay. He's like, sir, I, I've seen this before. You, you have a case of trying to do a major acquisition before an IPO. And what's neat about that is that journey did culminate in an IPO. So where were you on that day and, and what was going through your head? Yeah, it was during the pandemic. So I was working from home. We had all these great plans to go to New York and like ring the bell. Uh, and, you know, that just wasn't in the cards for various reasons. So I remember that morning and we were watching it and the stock like wouldn't open. They're like, you know, because when you go where they do it virtually, you have the guy from the NASDAQ on the, on the, on the video call with you. And he's like talking you through the technical aspects of how they were trying to price it and have the market makers going out and getting a sense. So the market opens, but the stock doesn't open yet. And so they're telling you, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to cross the right levels and get everything. And then all of a sudden you know, they're like, okay, we got it. You know, the buyers and sellers, they've lined up, right? We're going to go, we're going to release it. And then it, it took off. I, I don't remember. I, it was like, we, we think we priced at 21. I think we closed today at 42 or 40 or something like that. It was nuts. And so, you know, it was this big like release of emotion for me. I remember just being so excited. I mean, one, it was still a work day, but like I didn't do any other work. Everybody, <laughs> right? Was like, what else do you want me to be doing? I remember being like a pretty nice day, but everything was still in lockdown. I was like, I have to get out of the house. I got too much energy. I'm too happy in my life. So I called up two of my coworkers who lived in my neighborhood. I was like, guys, can we just go take a walk and get outside, like burn some energy? And so we did, and we just kind of took it out, walked down to the waterfront in Vancouver, Washington, like burned off some energy. But the whole day, I just felt like it was like floating on a cloud. It was one of the happiest days of my life. 
Was there a standard lockup on that? Like, how, do, how did you do all that work? The standard is, is generally like six months. Although, interestingly enough, when I when I started the process, I thought that was like a requirement, but it's actually not. The lockup is a negotiation between the underwriter and the insurer. I've actually seen some interesting thing happen where companies have said, hey, we'll enter into a lockup for six months, but if the stock pops by X, then like we want out of it or something like that because it's, it's fine. So we didn't do anything like that. We did a very basic, very standard one in ours was, was six months. So we, as employees, and as an insider, I couldn't start trading until six months after that. So I think December was like the first time employees could trade. That's one of the things that a lot of people on the outside don't realize that like, yes, employees are super jacked up and jazzed about it, but you do have to wait for a while, usually 180 days. Yeah, no, there's a risk. And then, you know, it's because of my position in the firm, I was subject to a 10B51 plan, meaning I had to go file documents with the SEC every six months laying out my plan sales. So like, I, you know, I actually didn't have that much control on a day that had no control on a day to day basis of if I, if I wanted to sell or not. So I had to lay out plans. You could only do that during certain open windows. It's very restrictive and it's for the right reasons, but I don't think people like realize that until they, until they get through it, that you don't have nearly as much freedom if you're at certain levels with your stock or public that as you might think. We talked to Lee Kirkpatrick, the former CFO of Twilio, and like Zoom Info, they were coming off a period where they were one of the first IPOs at the gate. So there was all this pent up demand and there hadn't been many IPOs for a while. And they said, let's just go first and, and try to optimize our situation. I think it was really smart for Zoom Info to do that too. It's kind of like no risk it, no biscuit, like let's go now and see what we can do. And there are probably a lot of companies thinking that now, to be honest, Philip, like should we be one of the first to, to break this? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. Like twenty three, obviously not a great year for IPOs. Had a few, a few come out. I know, you know, one or two have done pretty well, like Arm, who's who's big over here in in England, but others others didn't. I am very much looking to see what happens in twenty four. I, I get the sense a decent amount of people are trying to wait to twenty five, but twenty four might be kind of a feel it out. So I think if you're brave and you want to go now, there's not going to be a lot of competition in twenty four. Um, so yeah, if you're brave and you want to risk it, there might be some biscuit out there this year. Yeah. And we were talking to Tony Kim, head of technology investments at BlackRock, and he was saying there are more companies that are valued over a billion dollars in the private market than technology companies in the public markets. And if you look at how many companies are, are supposed to go, it's like you would literally have to have like one or two a day for like a year, year and a half. And the market just can't physically digest that many. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be interesting. I, my sense is that like the people will run dual tracks. So they'll look to either do a public or to do a strategic or financial transaction. Because as you mentioned, like all the, all the P firms have a lot of money sitting aside too, that they haven't really deployed in two years or so now. And so that money has got to be deployed per their operating agreements with their uh, LPs. So you know, I could certainly see a lot of dual tracks going on. Like, Hey, we'll, we'll go public if the market's right. But if not, like we'll, we'll, we'll turn this thing to somebody else. Speaking of scenario planning, as head of fp a at that time, I imagine you had to go through a lot of scenario analysis and maybe even build a beat and raise forecast. Like, What was some of the workload that went into preparing for the IPO? With regard to the IPO, I had two major roles. One, like providing all of the KPIs. You know, when we were doing that already, right? We had a pretty robust financial package. The interesting thing, the thing I probably didn't give enough credit to going in was that I had to prove every single number, every single number we gave to the lawyers with all of the backup proof and like walk them through all of the spreadsheets to see how it could get there. So literally you receive, you know, for everything you're putting in your S1, you have to go provide proof to the lawyers exactly where the number comes from. I'm not talking just the financial numbers. Financial numbers are relatively easy. You pick them out of your, hopefully your after ERP. I'm talking the KPI numbers, like net retention and gross retention and number of customers and all of these things, right? So I had to go prove all that stuff out, detail upon detail upon detail. And then when you actually go into market and you're, you know, you see some of your, some of your pitch decks and stuff that maybe have different metrics, you also have to go verify all of those. Like there is no number you can talk about in the lead up to IPO that you, that you can give without providing the backup. So I probably under credited that in my thinking about how much work I was going to do in the IPO. So that was one big chunk. And the second big chunk pre-IPO was building the model, as you said. So like, yes, we would have our forecast models. Yes, we have all this. But we had to give a model that we could actually go and hand off to the analysts who were getting ready to cover us. And it had to be at the right level of specificity that they could understand the business, but obviously not so much that you're giving away kind of all, all of your inside information and everything. So coming up with that right 
that right model was super important. And as you alluded to, it led into the beat and raise process, which, which came kind of after the go public. But yeah, we're running numbers all the time that don't just look at, are we going to beat this quarter? But it would say something like, if we beat this quarter by X, what does that mean for what we guide for next quarter in the full year so that we can beat those by Y? And then hopefully when we beat that by Y, ratchet up again to beat the next quarter by Z. So it's like a it's like fully connected model that just connects across multiple quarters going forward. That is like a two variable algebra equation, basically, that you're you're playing with. So that was it was really interesting to me to like learn how to do that and to see how that works and how how you have to think about it because it forces you to think a lot about the future and about like how much leeway you actually have in your numbers. And when you IPO, you want to make sure like we're going to hit the next four quarters of what we're guiding to, right? Yeah. It's like, that's vital. If you, if you come out and you miss, it's not a good look. We actually, we came out in our first quarter public, um, which we, which have been in Q2 2020, we, we blew out all the financial numbers, but our stock actually went down the first one because the market didn't like one metric, which was our billings number. And that's actually not one we had focused all that much on. We had such great numbers everywhere else, like billings were just kind of less important due to various ways that we ran the business. And then so after that, we did so much work around like being able to forecast billings and project billings and go get the straight reasons why it should look like this instead of look like that. And so that was that was certainly a learning as well too. Like every number matters. Everybody's always looking for the one that goes wrong, right? They care about the one that goes wrong much more than they care about the 10 that go right. So you got to be on your game on all your numbers and make sure that you are set up to tr- make sure that you know you have an accurate forecast in your back pocket so you know exactly what you can go tell the street. That's the juice people come to the podcast for. All right, now we're, now we're cooking. And, and so how did you go about choosing which metrics you would disclose and, and guide to? There, I know there's a lot of thought into that. It's, it's not just which ones you disclose and guide to. It's also how often you disclose them, which was a thing I didn't understand till we, till we did that. So I give you an example. At ZoomInfo, we only disclose the net retention number once per year, as opposed to every quarter, like some people, whereas other other metrics we would disclose kind of every quarter. So it's a balance, CJ. There's no exact answer. There's a lot of art because the natural inclination of a company is to not want to disclose anything, right? It's like, hey, this is our data, like leave us alone, just you guys go do your thing. And obviously the investor community wants every single metric they can. Because, you know, they, they want all the information they get. The, the tension there is like the investor community may, you know, not use your data the way you use it. And then therefore they can get a bad result or a different result than what you're intending. And so I go back to the billings example. We didn't focus on billings because we, 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 we build differently. We allowed people to pay annually or quarterly or monthly. Like that's how we ran our business and we were good at it like that. Other SaaS companies only allowed for upfront annual billing, so they would get tremendous amounts of billing numbers. Where ours were like look different than other people's. We got slammed for it, but it was like, no, no, we told you it was going to look different, but people didn't want to want to hear that. So it's really like it's you you look at the feed, you listen to the feedback you get from your analyst community, and in the meetings you have, they're called testing the waters meetings that you have pre IPO to see like, hey guys, what's important to you. You look obviously at like what you feel best about internally, because let's face it, like some of your internal metrics are better and more robust and you have more confidence that you could forecast them accurately than other measures. And you try to combine that. What's the information that helps me get the best valuation that the investor community wants? Plus, what's the best information that makes me look the best, provides the most accurate way to understand the business, and it's easy for other people to comprehend and, and model with that I can also forecast accurately. I think it's like that combination of factors. That's like five dimensional chest. And potentially the hardest part of it is if you say it once, they're going to be super suspicious if you stop giving that metric. You can never stop giving a metric. I mean, you, like that's not a legal requirement, but you know, you can like from a practical sense, you can never stop giving a metric if you, if you say it once. It's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Which makes it hard when you're trying to like, you know, answer the questions in the earnings call Q and A. Like you can say a lot of stuff in there, but if you say something in there, you know, they're like, well, why hey, can you guys just disclose that more often? And it's like, no, no, we're answering your question, but like it's just for this instance here. Yeah, you're totally right about that. Uh net dollar retention. Did you give an exact number? Or did you say it was above or below like a benchmark? Uh we gave a number to the nearest whole number. So like uh, like you would say like one hundred and fifteen percent retention or there seems to be a trend now where companies will just say we were above 120%, but they won't tell you like, was it 
132? Was it 128? Oh, that's a, I haven't seen that. That would that would that would annoy me if I yeah, it annoys me a bit because they used to be way more transparent about it. But I think companies are, or the the sell side analysts used to beat them up if like uh, it fell from like 140 to one. I don't know, 35, which is still stellar, but they're like, wow, that's a huge drop in absolute numbers. So they're like, screw it. If you're going to beat us up on it, we're only going to tell you if it's above a number or not. Yeah, I could see doing that in like guidance, but I couldn't see doing that as an actual like that. That's interesting. Yeah, CrowdStrike and Datadog are doing that now. So it's the hottest new trend. Well, maybe to segue a bit as a finance leader, I'm curious if you have any frameworks that you rely upon to either communicate messages or make hard decisions. Yeah, there are, there are two things. I'll kind of break one of ones like a bit more qualitative and one's a bit more quantitative. So I'll try to them up like that. The, the qualitative one I like, I think in my career, I've just found this one to be super easy and super effective whenever I'm having a meeting where like a QBR or something where I need to explain a topic. It, I just divide the, divide the slide into two and say, here's what's worked well and here's what didn't work in whatever time period I'm talking about. And you can get a lot of mileage out of that, out of three or four bullets underneath. And I think it's kind of like, you know, saying, hey, guys, this is what we did well. Hope you agree. Like, do you agree? And they think this is what we need to go work on and acknowledging this, that you can ask me questions about it. We can talk about it. We can build the plans around it. But I want you to say you're good with the thing on the left and we can kind of scratch through that and we'll go focus on the thing on the right. So when people present to me, I encourage that format and that's one I use. Super simple, but one I found to be pretty effective. We talked to Dave Kellogg, executive in residence at Balderton Capital over there, and one of one of my favorite SaaS metric godfathers. And that's his favorite slide for a board deck too. And he thinks by definition, a CEO should use it and spend 20 minutes on it because everything on there is worthy of going through which you're going to tee it up. Yeah, essentially, I just, I, so I've, I've been tasked with managing board deck over here. We have a board meeting in a few weeks and my dad, I actually put that slide in for my CEO too. And he's like, hey, hey, this out. Yeah. And then the, listen, the quantitative one that I like, and this is, this may be a bit broad and I'll try to explain it, but any, the way I look at the world, anything that would, can either roll forward or roll backward, I want my team to do that. And when I say roll forward or backward, I mean things that can connect across time. They should. So the, the the most pertinent example to a SaaS company is roll your ARR forward, right? So if you start with $100 of ARR uh, mm-hmm. last month, and you have 110 this month. How did you get there? Show me the puts and takes to get there. You should be able to do that going backward to show historical trends. And you should be able to go forward to show how you're forecasting. But ARR is the one that I'm sure most people will know about. Like, oh, yeah, Philip, we know that. Like, that's sure. Table stakes. Yeah, totally. But super effective. But like, we roll forward headcount comp costs, right? I've done that before. We're saying, hey, hey, my average cost of a person last year was, you know, $100,000 $100, a head. This year's one hundred and fifteen. dollars Well, show me how we got there. Well, hey, we brought people in that were more expensive. We turned people that were less expensive. We gave raises and in currency impacts were this, right? And you can kind of bridge it over time and do it. And so we can roll it forward, roll it backward. So I, I encourage my fp a team to like anything that can roll, make it roll. So in the business now that I'm in Paddle, which is a take rate business, as opposed to an ARR business, we're actually rolling our take rate period over period. So we can show our business leaders like how our take rate every month changes and we're rolling it by a geo and rolling by customer segment. We're doing kind of all of these things too. So you can just see how everything in the world connects. And then you can use that to, to model and forecast your business better, I think. I like how you're using the connective tissue from one period to another, because something that I've been trying to do as well when it comes to take rate in my business is how, how does that change with seasonality over time? Yeah. Yeah. It's super important. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, when I got here and you know, one of the things we weren't showing were lower, like you were stats over time, like time series, like left to right, just by month, like, let's just show whether, whether it be a PL, you know, whether it be KPIs, we were literally just sending our board, like the monthly snapshots, like we can't do anything with that. When I was in the private equity world and I was working, you know, in, in facial ops for, for those guys, I, you know, I, I worked with some companies and they were doing the same thing. It's like, well, guys, like, how, how do we, know, how does anybody know if you're getting better or worse? We're just showing the one period. Like, you got to be true to yourself, right? To like show the time. And we can then we can ask some questions of, are you getting, are you improving? Are you declining? What's happening? What are the trends in the business? I'm always actually pretty surprised when I, when I don't see that somewhere. It's like, no, no, this is, this is the basics. Like, let's do everything over time. And look at it. I also think when you go to budget, people sometimes assume that you're cre- recreating the wheel each year. It's like, I should be able to roll forward at least 75% of what I know about this business. Everything should connect 
left to right over time is is my opinion. You kind of have to prove to me that it doesn't. That'll give you a few words for me. So yeah, I fully agree with you. But budgeting in particular, I mean, that's how you get a rolling forecast, right? So like one of the things we we were really good at at Zoom Info I had a great team underneath me. You know, we rolled forward 18 months, a three statement forecast every month and rebuilt it every month. So we like literally you could pop in a dollar of new sales into our model. And then we could tell you 18 months from now, the free cash flow impact that dollar would have, right? And that was super powerful because it allowed us to look forward, allowed us scenario plan, allowed us to answer questions of like, well, hey, if we went and did that initiative, what would that look like? Or Hey, if like this event happened over here, like do we would we need to adjust our board or um, our earnings guidance or anything like that? So, yeah, it's super powerful. And then just having to connect every month is is pretty vital that process. I love it. Like Limp Biscuit said, "Keep on rolling, partner." Okay. Well, speaking of rolling, we're gonna roll into what we like to call our long ass lightning round. And so, I always ask people. What's an example of something you've screwed up on the job? It could be here or a previous role. Yeah. In my first job out of college, I was an investment banker and I was running some numbers for it. I think it was my first year, you know, as I was like, I was young, I was raw. I was running some numbers. I was doing, I was doing, we were running some numbers around a debt transaction for, for somebody. I ran some numbers. We like presented them to the, to the client. And then I got back to the office and I realized they were wrong and like, wrong. It, it wasn't like a mortal blow, right? But it was like, you're wrong. And I felt awful. And my my first boss, a guy named Jerry Ford, he said, well, Phil, you have to call the client and you have to tell them you messed up and that you got to fix it. And like, that's hard, man, at 22. So I did. And fortunately, the guy was like super nice. The CFO who we were working there was like, hey, man, I get it. Found me with He's like, I thought it looked a little wrong, but I didn't want to say anything. So, you know, but like, thanks for calling. It's all good. Just send us anything and let's, let's keep on going. So like, I learned a lot from that one that, you know, if we were the customer or the client, that is just having like the grace for the junior analyst to kind of say, listen, get it. Not a moral blow. We're fine. We want is like really important. It like really helped me get through that. But two, from my boss's perspective to like make me go call them was like an important moment of development. I think in my career, maybe take responsibility for my mistakes. So, you know, I totally, I totally respect that. And I'm glad that he, he made me do that. Now that you're the boss, would you make an analyst make that phone call? 100%. I think it's the right thing to do. And listen, when I, like for my people, I tell them, look, I made mistakes. You're, you're, you're going to make mistakes. Let's, let's limit them. Right. But when we do, let's acknowledge them. Let's own them. I will provide you the cover. That's my job. So like, I will ultimately go take the blame. I will provide the cover. You have to kind of own up to it. But, you know, when you do well on my team, you get all the praise. That's that's how it goes. And when you mess up, which you will, like, I'll take the blame. That's my job. That's what I get paid to do. So that, you know, to give you kind of the space to realize that you're going to make a mistake, but like, we're all going to make mistakes. So like, that's how I think about the world. Too. I think the best leaders that I've been on a team for are the ones that do take that blame because you don't feel like you make a mistake and then it's all eyes on you like they give you the they carve out a space for you to recognize what you did and get better at it but not feel like the whole world's crashing down it's the leaders that i've worked for that didn't like where it's like you feel like you're just out there alone after you make a mistake and i think you really said that well that's why leaders do get paid more because you you should be able to take one on the chin for your team yeah and i sort of don't think my boss like left me on the cold i'm sure he called the the it was more like a, you know, like it was a development moment and helped me with my maturity and such too. So yeah, I, mean, I think we're in agreement there. All right. So if you could tell your younger self something, knowing what you know today, what would you tell them? I think I would say like, hey, it'll it'll kind of be okay. I it was like when I was younger, I was I was even more though. This will probably surprise people because I'm sure they think this about me now. But I was like super aggressive and probably didn't give things as much space to breathe as I should. That makes sense. You know, maybe didn't handle things with some of the grace that was required for certain situations. Certainly didn't give people probably the, the, the space they needed to, to make some of those mistakes that we talked about. It tend to be a little bit hard core. And just kind of knowing that like, you're going to need to rely on other people at some points. Like you can't do it all yourself. You're going to make mistakes too. That's kind of the way of the world, but like, it will all be okay. Go hard, but like recognize that, you know, other people have different ways of approaching things. Yeah, I'd probably tell myself a similar thing. Be like, dude, just chill the hell out every once in a while. Yeah, something like that. Probably shake me a little bit maybe when I say it. 
Can you walk me through your finance software stack? What tools are you using today to, to get the job done as a finance leader? Roll the theme music, producer Nancy. And with that, it's time to rep yo stack, sponsored by Tropic, the next gen procurement platform helping modern CFOs take control of their budgets and bottom line. By combining approval workflows, supplier management, and pricing benchmarks all in one place, Tropic makes savings opportunities easy to find and act on. Visit tropicapp.io to learn how. Yeah, I'm super excited for Paddle. We have gone live with NetSuite as of a week ago, actually. So very proud of my team, of Nate Carbray and, and, and Jacques, who runs our finished operations. When I got here in September, they came to me and said, hey, we we bought NetSuite. We had NetSuite, by the way. Maybe we're going to go live in March. And then, you know, last week's not March, it's January. We actually went live within January. So in the past few months, we've been able to accelerate that timeline and get live. So that's a big, a big thing I'm proud of the product for Paddle to have. So NetSuite is our ERP. For FPNA, we are running Pigment right now. It's one we inherited. So we're kind of reevaluating it to see. I have experience with Adaptive. Before that, kind of at Zoom Info, we, we built Adaptive from scratch there. We use Spindesk for kind of expense reimbursement. And we're still big Excel users. I would never not be an Excel user. That's how I kind of think about the world and view the world. I need to kind of look at the data with my keyboard, if that makes sense. So that's primarily our finance stack right now. It's not not the most complicated, but we don't, we don't need complicated right now. What's the most recent tool you've bought? Have you bought anything since you started? What a, a super useful tool called a numeric, which is like a black line. It's like you close automation. So, you know, when my, when my controller came in, he had a team that was pretty junior. So he's teaching them a lot and they didn't have a closed management tool. So they couldn't really check with each other. Like, Hey, these are the tasks I have to do as an accountant to compose the books this month. What's my progress? What's the team's progress? And it didn't really consolidate and check things for them. So this tool does all of that. And it makes the close kind of close process way cleaner, way faster, way more efficient. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good tool. That's the most recent thing we've, we've got, we bought actually. Okay. Final one I got for you here. What's the craziest thing you've seen someone try to expense or maybe you expense yourself? Listen, I follow the rules, man. So I've never had well, crazy expense stuff. Maybe I've just been super lucky. I mean, I knew I, I like raised my eyebrows at some people in my, I think in a guy, one of my team, one time, he, he like, he, he lives in Florida, actually. He never traveled very much. And so I told him to come out to Portland one time and like, you know, I saw the TSA pre-check expense come up. I was like, well, maybe, but he didn't ask me for that. Okay. So maybe that's fine. And then I saw like a steak dinner pop up in the expense report. And so I was like, hey, man, I'd like, I don't know what it's like in your world, but like we have these rules here and they say like, you can spend this much for our food and this much for this. And like, you didn't do it. And yeah, he was kind of embarrassed. He was like, oh, it's my first time. I don't I never really travel for it before. I'm like, yeah, but like common sense. You did have a cool trip that you told me about that you got to take. I did have one for me. Yeah, we didn't expense it. But one of the, one of the super cool things that happened to me, we were doing the ranking deal, actually. It was like one of those times where it was like super stressful, right? And it was hard. And I got a call from my CEO on a Sunday morning, Henry Shaw, you know, Sunday morning call from Henry. It's like, oh man, what's, what's broken? Like, what did I do this time? And he said, hey, what are you doing today? I was like, I'm probably working. Like, you know, what are you doing? He's like, meet me at the airport in, in two hours. I was like, okay. So when he said the airport, he met like the private jet terminal. So I roll up and meet him at the private jet terminal at Portland International Airport. And somebody had flown in that he knew out in California, who was a Seattle Seahawks fan, picked us up in the plane. We flew up to Seattle for, for the game and then you know, flew back that night. So like that was a pretty cool experience. So one that, you know, I probably will never have happen again, but it was just like really awesome. And I think the moral of that story, CJ, is always answer the phone when your CEO calls you, particularly, at, you know, Sunday mornings. That's a baller story. I like that. Wow. We're going to end on that note. Philip, thanks for being generous with your time and appreciate all the insights. CJ, this was great, man. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good day over there. Yeah. Best of luck at Paddle. Roll the credits, producer Nancy. The Run the Numbers podcast is part of the Turpentine Network of Podcasts. It is produced by Nancy Shu and edited by Justin Golden. Artwork made by some AI thing. Yelling an intro by Fat Joe. Don't forget to give us five stars. I really need this.